Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad that you're with me tonight. This is Kate Kress from St. James in the City, Conversations with Kate. And I'm very happy tonight to have as my guest, we have as our guest, Mary Nichols, a beloved member of St. James and preeminent environmental lawyer and chair of the California Air Resources Board, otherwise known as CARB and all around clean air warrior. She's a hero, and we know that uh, fresh out of law school, she filed one of the first lawsuits under the Clean Air Act and has been full speed ahead since then. And so she's with us tonight, and I want you to feel that she's really with us. And in order for that to happen, I'd love you to be on the chat, uh, put your questions in there, and I'll be able to pose them uh, to Mary so that she can be uh, really responding to what's on your mind when we talk about uh, clean air tonight. So while you're getting your questions organized, I'm going to get started by just saying, first of all, hello, Mary. Hi, Kate. Pleasure <laughs> to be here. It's so nice to have you here. And um, the first question I have is really, how did you get started? How did you get into the whole environmental profession in the first place? Well, you know, there wasn't an environmental profession when I was growing up. So that's kind of the first thing to say is that when I went to law school, there weren't any classes in environmental law. The whole topic didn't really exist. This all came about in the 19, early 1970s, really going back to Earth Day in the late 60s. And I am a child of that era. So um, I happen to have grown up in a very beautiful place with great natural surroundings, upstate New York. Uh, and I, you know, grew up with a, a father who was particularly interested in um, the outdoors and hiking and all of that. But really what got me into the environmental movement was that um, I moved to Los Angeles right after I finished law school, wanting to do something in a public interest way and the whole environmental movement was just getting started at that point. But mainly, um, if you live in LA, and especially if you came here in those days from somewhere else, the most obvious environmental issue was air pollution because it was terrible. And it didn't seem like anybody was doing about it, anything about it. So I thought, well, I could do something about this. Was it visible back then? I mean, could you actually see sort of, was the sky yeah, well, of course, a lot of it was what you could see, which was the mountains to the east of us or any kind of crisp outlines of buildings or uh, of the horizon. Uh, but there was also a color to the air. We had these bright uh, sunsets were sort of a hideous orange that comes from <laughs> nitrogen oxides in the air. And, and days when the sky was just kind of grayish, brownish color, which, you know, I think most people recognize the difference between fog and smog. You know, there is such a thing as fog, it does happen, mm -hmm. and it's a natural phenomenon, but when you add pollution to it, it turns a different color and it's very ugly and you can smell it. You could really smell the air in those days too. So did you feel, I mean, did you feel a sense of call at this point? I mean, did something, Yes, uh, I, I certainly felt uh, a sense of outrage <laughs> and people that I knew who had grown up in Los Angeles before smog because it really didn't exist. It, you know, there's this whole thing about how LA was known as the Valley of the Smokes and they used to get um, inversion layers from time to time, which would sort of clamp a lid on the basin so that, you know, you'd have a day or two of really bad air. But the worst of it really didn't appear until the Second World War and the, the whole rush of industry and people with cars into the LA basin, which set off the whole, um, the, the whole phenomenon of LA smog adding to the backyard incinerators and you know the other kinds of burning that people used to do uh but yeah i also <clears throat> my political background was that i had been in the civil rights movement in the 60s and that was what really ignited my political passions and um i saw this as an affront uh to people and i felt like 
you know, rich people could find ways to evade it. You would either, you know, stay in your perfectly air conditioned house or you would uh, go to your place, you know, out in Palm Springs or, you know, in the basin or whatever. And other people didn't have that choice. And it wasn't just that it was ugly or that it smelled bad. It was also that we already knew by that point that Mm -hmm. it was unhealthy. It was hurting people, especially children and elderly people. And the statistics were piling up about its impact on people's lungs. So it really was a public health issue. So had the Clean Air Act happened then at this point? The the Clean Air Act was uh, passed and signed uh, by, was signed by Richard Nixon. It was the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1970. And I graduated from law school in 1971. So I moved out to Los Angeles right after that. The law was really just coming into effect and so i was able to file you know some of the first lawsuits under that new law and it gave us a new tool to use to fight back Mm -hmm. and um a lot's happened since from that time until now but i want i have a question about right now which i think is on a lot of people's minds which is whether this stay-at-home order that we're all living with right now Mm -hmm. is is doing anything good for the air Oh, well, yes, we uh, we take measurements on a real time, constant basis with a network of uh, monitoring stations all over the state of California. So we'll, we have very good data. Um, however, we don't usually publish that data every minute because sometimes there's glitches in the system. And also the air is variable. The pollution varies by time of day, by the temperature in the air. And so you want to give yourself some time to kind of look back over some period of time and see what was going on. But by and large, we have had some of the best air measurements over a period of the last couple of months that we've had in in many, many years. And we know that that's mostly attributable to the fact that uh, people aren't driving. And the economy is down also. It's not just the cars, although it is mostly the cars. Some of that, unfortunately, is made up for by the fact that um, if you've been in a place where you can see uh, what's going on on the freeways or you've been, you know, looking at any of the photos, you realize that delivery vehicles, uh, the freight sector, is not on holiday. If anything, they're... uh, cranking up to fill the available space because many, many people are now both uh, not going out, but also ordering everything. And it's all coming right to your door. Okay. (laughs) All right. I want to ask you about that in a minute, but I just wanted to (laughs) tell you that Tom Abbott, uh, our friend Tom Abbott's on the chat and he said he moved here in 78 and the air was frightening. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that that's Yes, still in the in the bad old days, and in your career, um, you you ended up changing that to a large degree. Can you can you tell us what you did that had such a big impact on air quality in California? Well, sure, and of course, I didn't do this all by myself. But the litigation that we were able to bring and then follow up on did make a difference. And um, fortunately, we had a lot of political support behind it. I think the most important thing that we did was to force Detroit to clean up the cars. And, you know, today, even a gasoline engine, which, you know, we're now trying to make obsolete because we think we need to go to zero emission vehicles that don't burn anything. But even today, the most gas guzzling car you could buy only uh, emits about 1% of the amount of pollution that it would have emitted back in the 1970s. So we're talking about 99% cleaner. Um, Of course, the industry didn't go along happily Mm -hmm. uh, or willingly most of the time. But at the end of the day, once they were required to do it, they did, and they brought their best engineers and uh, people designed cars that could um, not only meet the air standards, but also get very good fuel economy, have good performance. And so, you know, there are still a few people out there who want to have the kind of old cars that you used to get where you could take the car apart and put it back together again and, you know, fix every piece of it. You can't do that anymore, right? It's Your car is basically a computer. computer and yeah. 
very controlled. But on the other hand, you know, in every other respect, um, not just its environmental performance, uh, your your car is a lot better as a machine than it was back in the seventies when we started. So, so that was a that was a national effort. Well, uh, California led the way at every step, though. You know, we always, because we were given the right under the 1970 Clean Air Act to adopt more stringent standards than whatever the federal standards were, if we could show that uh, they were technologically feasible, which we always were able to do because we hired very smart people, many of whom had actually come out of the industry to come and work with us. Mm -hmm. And they helped to create standards that then pushed the whole uh, regulatory program forward. But it started uh, in every instance, you know, the catalytic converter, the onboard diagnostic equipment, all the things that we take for granted today um, began in California. Wow, that's lovely. It, you can tell I'm very proud of it, by the way. I mean, I know, having been a part of it. California. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a California. Jared has just come on and he said, um, he said, the city of Los Angeles is considering eliminating the Office of Climate Emergency Mobilization and the Climate Emergency Commission because of budget shortfalls. Is that true? I don't know. I hadn't heard that. I actually, that's news to me if it's, yeah. if it's true. I don't know. That's, that's too bad. What were the what were the biggest challenges in reducing uh, air pollution in in Los Angeles, for instance? Well, you know, we focus on the on the vehicles, and it's partly because we're so dependent on them, having been built up as a spread out city uh, without a really uh, functional uh, central core and a subway system, you know, like New York or. Even, uh, you know, Chicago is not quite as dense as New York, but um, pretty much wherever you live, you can get a train, you know, to go to wherever it is you need to go. Um, California, Los Angeles specifically, uh, was deliberately uh, built on a spoke system where people could live in a suburban lifestyle. And the only way to get around would be um, uh, by car or, I guess if you really couldn't afford it by bus, and of course, if you really could even afford the bus, you could take take a bicycle for miles and miles and miles. But most people uh, drove wherever they went. So we, we were car culture. There was a light rail system, wasn't there? That they took there was a light rail system back in the um, 40s and the 50s, which was torn out. And there's a whole, there's actually a movie about that called Who Killed Roger Rabbit? And there is a <laughs> there's books been written on the topic, but um, it was a conspiracy. It wasn't a secret conspiracy. It was a very open conspiracy uh, between the oil industry, which was uh, very prominent in California. You know, we we are the seventh largest oil producing state in the United States, and you know, my house in Los Angeles in the Hancock Park area is built over an old oil field. There's still oil being produced in the LA basin as you can see when you drive down La Cienega to uh, to the Los Angeles airport you know we're still we're still pumping oil out from underground here so um, it was really the oil industry with the auto industry that convinced the powers that be that the um, uh, the old uh, train system, the light rail system was interfering with traffic and slowing things down and they needed to get rid of it and they did. If they and now we've been rebuilding it. What would it have been like for LA if it hadn't been removed, I wonder? Um, well, <laughs> it would have been better in many ways, I suppose, but um, it would have been, uh, it would have, we would never have undergone some of the worst of the pollution without a doubt. Mary Abbott's remembering growing up in the San Fernando Fernando Valley and mm -hmm. the feeling of pain when taking a deep breath in the mm -hmm. 50s and 60s. Yep. So um, we used to have smog alerts uh, where the uh, word would go out to the schools that they had to bring the kids in from the playground and not let them play outside. Athletic events would be canceled uh, based on the, the uh, ozone readings. We don't have those uh, kinds of levels anymore. We still have too much air pollution. It's not 
where we think it should be for health, but it's nothing like that kind of acute uh, air episodes that we used to have. It's incredible. You know, Stuart Falk is, is remembering back in 1968 when he was working um, at the Federal Government Air Pollution Control Administration mm -hmm. um, that the Dean of the Washington Cathedral testified about the damage that air pollution was doing to the church facade. Yes. So ozone, which um, we know of as a health hazard, um, is also something that damages materials. In fact, the man who is known as the father of air pollution control in California, Dr. Ari Hagen-Schmidt, was a professor of chemistry at Caltech, and he was a plant uh, biology guy, plant chemist, I guess, um, and he was the person who figured out what it was in the car exhaust that was causing plants to die uh, in his laboratory. So the first signs of smog as a, something that could be identified in the air came from pine needles that were turning brown and dropping off of the trees in the Angeles National Forest, damage to uh, rubber, uh, which you know used to be tires were made out of rubber, and building materials that would corrode. Uh, and that's all from that same same chemical. You're still reminiscing in the chat about the battle. They, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> John Thies says that he grew up in, on Wilton Place and that uh, they couldn't see the Hollywood sign. Mm -hmm. And as a 12 year old, he rode his bike to deliver papers each afternoon. And many days he'd come home and his eyes would be burning. Yeah. And that it was. We still have that when I moved out here in 1971. You still had plenty of days like that. Yeah. Um, Why did people put up with it? Well, after a while, they decided they didn't have to put up with it. And they didn't. It seemed so health conscious, you know, of all yeah. the people that you wouldn't think would ever put up with it, right? Right. Well, and that used to be one of the arguments that I would get occasionally for people who thought we were going too far and imposing regulations that were too strict was, um, well, I grew up here and I play tennis and, you know, we produce some of the best athletes in the world. How can you say that this air is so bad for people's health? And the answer is, well, think about how fantastic it would be if they didn't have all the smog. Yes, yes. Um, so Jack Pitts says, given the, I don't know what this means, given the spoke layout that Mary described, what will or might LA look like in the future? Oh, well, I was referring to the idea that you had the, the red cars, you know, the old Pacific cars that essentially went along the paths of today's freeways. The, the freeway system today is laid out along the lines that the train system used to be on. So if we restore that, and add you know more to the subway system as well um how would los angeles look well one of the things that i think i have to say in defense of los angeles is that it's actually a lot denser than most people think um you know we're not uh, we're not a high-rise city but um in fact um there have been a, a, a lot of studies that have shown that most people in la actually drive fewer miles and live closer to where they work than in many other cities in the United States. You know, we have a certain proportion of people who unfortunately have to live, you know, 50 miles away from where they work and drive horrendous distances. Mm -hmm. But most people are probably closer to you, I would say, um, in the sense that they live a few miles away from yeah. where you still need to have a car, but it's not going to change that much if we get denser and drive less. So people um, in the chat are, are starting to, they're, they're wanting to get practical. Before before we came on air, I was asking Mary what kind of car I should buy. <laughs> <laughs> and right. Nancy Redford says, Mary, what choices can we make in our everyday lives that can make a real difference in improving our LA ecology? For instance, are there batteries in electric cars? Uh, are, are the batteries in electric cars a bad trade-off? Oh, uh, no, they're not. Um, you know, at the end of the life of a battery electric car, the battery starts to decline in terms of how 
uh, much charge it will have, how much of a charge it'll take, how far you can go with it. And eventually you're gonna have to either replace the battery or replace the whole car. So what is gonna happen to that used battery? Right. First of all, during the whole time that you were driving, you were using way less energy than if you'd been using an internal combustion engine, but the bat you have to do something with the battery. So right now what we're doing with the batteries is um, they're actually being collected and um, used for storage of electricity. So, you know, at times when we generate more electricity in the region than we need, businesses and office buildings can use battery storage to uh, hold on to some of that energy and then take it out when they need it. So it helps to even out the supply, prevent the need to build more power plants because you can uh, you can draw on the electricity that otherwise would have been wasted during peak periods of generating solar and wind especially. So we're, we're actually using used batteries today as energy storage, which used to be kind of like a, a dream. That, yeah out of what you could do it already it already exists today um, and eventually although this is not very usable today there will be ways to recharge the batteries and uh, refresh them so that you know okay. it will so last much news. longer that's good news if you want to get an electric car yes um, and then what about other things in our everyday lives that we can be doing and that sort of connects to a question that I want to ask you too which is um, what can churches also be doing to help address sure, sure. Our, uh, well i mean first of all i think um for most of us regular people who uh you know go about living our lives um the choices that we make about what to buy and where to spend our money and who to vote for are probably the most important choices that we make that affect the environment right so it really matters who we elect, if we elect people who uh, care about the environment and are willing to uh, work towards that or who don't. And it matters um, if they are willing to have priorities in terms of providing transit for people uh, or for um, you know making it possible for people to live closer to where they work. Um, but there are bicycle lanes for people who, who are able and, and you know, can, can ride their bikes to places uh, where they need to go during the day. And a lot more of that is already starting to happen, I think. Um, so it matters how we vote, mm -hmm. hearing you say that. And um, what you buy, what you eat does matter. Um, to what we buy. So what about ordering every little thing on Amazon? How do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, I think uh, it would be better if Amazon were delivering things in vehicles that also didn't pollute and were and if we could get used to the idea that if you ordered something today you didn't necessarily have to have it tomorrow um, in Europe they've done a lot with mandating that orders be consolidated so instead of having a single truck that just carries one product to you know one neighborhood they will insist that the entire truck be fully loaded with a number of different things so that they can be dropped off in different places in order to operate more efficiently and that helps with congestion in the cities as well so um but i'm not i'm not down on the idea of delivery i think it just has to happen you know in trucks that also aren't polluting and you know from an environmental perspective it would probably be better if we just all bought fewer things that we're going to throw away all the time too that's it's the throwaway aspect of the society is probably more of an more of a problem than what we consume and then you were about to talk about food as well well i was just going to say unfortunately food waste really is a big issue and um finding ways that our food system can be more efficient and that we personally can you know throw away less stuff um it is true that particularly now the way it's produced um meat is is definitely a bigger factor in terms of pollution of the air and water and mm -hmm. its impact on global warming than um plant life and so forth um i think all of us have probably 
those of us who are uh, growing older, which some of us are, um, have been told time and time that, again, that uh, eating less red meat is good for us, uh, better for us, and it's better for the planet, too. Yeah, so much better for the planet. And, and here's another question, which is from someone named Karen. I don't know which Karen this is. Mary, could LA ever become a city where public transit is not largely for the poor and people of color, but for everybody? Yeah, uh, well, that was the idea behind the um, rail system. I think if we ever get really good system, really good transit that goes to uh, Los Angeles airport, and if air travel becomes a thing that people are doing again, which I believe it will, even there'll be, even though I think there'll be less of it, then uh, definitely that will be not just used by poor people. Um, the biggest thing that I think would make a difference is if uh, free or subsidized parking were not everywhere and if you just couldn't park in various places um, people would take transit and it would be a more uh, a, a more egalitarian system than it is now and that was actually starting to happen now of course with gasoline prices oil prices so low um, that uh, it makes driving uh, less expensive and the biggest factor has been the rise of the shared or the ride hailing services, the, the lifts and Ubers of Is the that world. A good thing for, from an environmental standpoint? Well, I think, you know, these, uh, these services are terrific if they are being uh, run with efficient vehicles. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. It's not going to help the environment any if your uh, Lyft or Uber driver shows up in a, you know, an older car without a good pollution control system. Yeah. And, and if they're driving around all day looking to pick up rides. Um, well, you mentioned before about the delivery trucks. If yes. They efficient. And now we're talking about Uber. So, but, so it sounds like, I'm wondering, especially with the delivery trucks, are yeah. there... Are there um, regulations for them too, in the same way that there are for passenger? Uh, there are starting to be. That's the next thing that ARB is working on right now. There's yeah. a advanced clean transportation rule. We already have rules that require transit systems to start going to zero emission buses. And those aren't just battery, by the way. There are also um, fuel cell uh, vehicles that use hydrogen as a fuel uh, that's also zero emitting. Um, these are all things that are kind of in the process of transition now. I suspect that somewhere around 2035 or so, pretty much every new vehicle that rolls off of an assembly line is going to be a zero emission vehicle. And gradually we'll see the older kinds of vehicles just you know, going off to uh, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the great elephant graveyard <laughs> yeah so um so it sounds like you can you can imagine this is sort of getting to that what's la gonna look like you can imagine yeah, yeah. Um, i i could absolutely imagine um certainly in um, the lifetimes of my kids and of my grandkids uh, that uh, there will be uh, a, a, a whole city which is um essentially zero pollution Part of that, by the way, also means restoring the ability of our natural systems to um, absorb because there will be some, uh, some combustion that will take place in various places in natural gas, in, of natural gas, in manufacturing facilities. It's not all going to be absolutely zero emission um, that we're going to capture and store carbon. And a lot of it is going to be stored Oh, here she comes. There she is. She's ready to visit. This is Muti. Um, Muti, uh, is my, Muti is my walking companion. And oh, nice. My friend. Um, you know, that we will have, uh, uh, that we have trees. I mean, trees are part of the system. And so is having um, areas where the soil is capable of, of absorbing water and not reflecting heat back up into the air that has to be then cooled off with air conditioning. So there's a, there, there's a whole um, 
vision of what a sustainable city would be like. And it's not that radically different from what we have today, but I think there's a lot more uh, consciousness about, um, you know, the particularly the role of, of plants and, and soils and keeping our, keeping our city healthy and us healthy. And that's healthy. Peter Reinke, our headmaster at St. James School is reminding us that Amazon is investing in a lot of drones mm -hmm. and that Ford is doubling down on motorized single person scooters. Yeah. And, um, uh, and he's wondering if ride sharing with these single scooters will become more popular. I don't know. I just saw that um, one of the initial scooter companies, Lime, was just bought by Uber. So Uber has clearly decided they're going to be a full service um, vehicle company and all electric. At least these scooters are all electric. All electric. Uh, but do you ride them? You ride it by yourself. You're not. You're not driven on it, right? That's right. That is right. And you have better have a good balance and be wearing a helmet too. Or you could, could be you could be in big trouble. I remember when I used to live in Uganda, we were we'd always get nervous riding boda bodas. You just get on the back of a motorcycle. Sometimes a helmet, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. uh, but Sarah Jean Thies is wondering: Are there energy savings with increasingly having this remote workforce, which we're all experiencing right now? So many of us. Absolutely. I mean, that's the biggest change that's happened <coughs> to our society as a whole as a result of the coronavirus. Is that? people are operating under these uh, work at home mandates and for the kinds of jobs that can be done remotely uh, by computer and uh, all the other electronic equipment we have, there's a huge savings there. And it's a savings on wear and tear of uh, the streets and roads. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's such amazing. It's an opportunity for learning right now, isn't it? Because we're, we're um, I think many of us are finding out how much we can do remotely. Yeah. I mean, there are some meetings that I know it takes a long time to get to, mm -hmm. exhausting by the time you're there, and and it's it does work remotely. Yeah, I think I think many employers are going to decide also that they don't need to pay the rents or pay the money to, you know, erect uh, office buildings for all their workers. That even if you have people coming in one or two days a week, if they're working at home the rest of the time, you can share the space more efficiently, and so they can save a lot of money on that as well. You know, um, speaking of saving money, Stuart uh, Fox says he sold his car six months ago, and while at times he misses it, LA is currently quite livable for the carless, he says. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I remember when I moved out to LA in 1971, um, uh, my husband and I had one car. He was working downtown. He was a lawyer and he worked for a firm, and I was in Century City with my public interest law firm. and. Every morning we'd get up and drive downtown, drop him off, and then I'd drive out to the west side. And every night we would do that in reverse. Of course, in those days, that only took a total of like a half an hour each way. And you, you just couldn't even dream of doing something like now. that now. Uh, Stuart also asked, what's the status of California's efforts to maintain stricter auto regulations than the weaker ones the current administration wants to make national? Uh, yes. Well, we are in a battle with the right now. Yeah, we're we're fighting with the federal administration right now over California's right to have stricter standards because the the current administration has decided that we should not be allowed to have stricter standards for greenhouse gases. They're not fighting us on whether we can regulate for NOx and SOx and the other traditional air pollution. Um, pollutants that, we, that we've always worked on. But um, ever since we ventured into the area of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, um, the, the uh, anti-climate people <laughs> have decided that we're going too far, that uh, the Clean Air Act doesn't give us this authority. So they have uh, basically tried to preempt us and we're fighting with them on this in federal court right now. Does it make you um, does it make you worried all the ways in which nationally it seems like um, uh, regulations are being lifted? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Um, 
our attorney general, Javier Becerra, has filed, I think it's now up to like 53 environmental lawsuits against the administration over these rollbacks. And it's it, it's not just an accident. I think maybe we were a little slow, I don't want to say naive, but maybe we didn't really believe that they could be as determined as it's turned out they are to just roll back everything that came into effect um, in the early years of the 2000s. All of the rules about cleaner power plants and uh, cleaner equipment and vehicles and all of that are all uh, have all been basically uh, attacked in the last couple of years. And if we don't succeed either through the courts or through a change of uh, government, then uh, it really will have a serious effect. I mean, we'll find ways probably to get around some of this, but it will be uh, much harder and more expensive probably. At, the, at a national level and then worldwide, CO2 levels are the highest that they've ever, ever been, right? Yep. So yeah. how do you, how, huh, how do I ask this? I mean, you, you've been working so hard these many years and achieve so much in California, and yet, with a with a with a sort of a fact like that looming, how how where is the hope for reversing climate change? Well, I think the hope lies um, eventually in a cooperative arrangement with countries all around the world. This isn't something that could only be done by California, even as you know, if we were to be as strict as anybody in the world, our our hope has always been that we could be a good example. So, you know, we would make a difference in terms of our own pollution, our own greenhouse gas emissions, but then we would also show that there are ways that you can control uh, the, the greenhouse gas without uh, bankrupting your economy. And in fact, that you can even, you know, become a place where you're a magnet for clean technologies and for the kind of growth that you'd like to have. We have to be sharing those ideas with other states and other countries. And um, we do that a lot. We have a pretty vibrant, active foreign service in effect. Um, it's not, uh, you know, we, we can't make treaties or, you know, wage wars, but we can collaborate with other jurisdictions. And we do, uh, including China. Uh, this started many years ago, but even now we have a joint uh, China, California, Climate Institute at the University of California, which um, involves exchanges of scientists and students and and ideas, and we're we're continuing to work on these things. Now, if we can't find ways that we can um, enter into real agreements, this is going to become very difficult. And there's no question that there's been backsliding since the Paris Accord mm -hmm. in 2015, and things are going in the wrong direction when it comes to cooperation. But um, I, one of the things that makes me continue to believe that we can be successful uh, is that uh, there's a lot more interest and commitment now on the part of the private sector than there used to be. Many international companies uh, are really, uh, they, they get it that uh, the current situation is unacceptable and that Part of the solution has to be uh, improving the quality of life and the abilities of people in the developing world to uh, become more prosperous and at the same time not pollute the way we did when we were first uh, coming into the industrial age. And, you know, we know so much more now and we have so many more technologies, but we have to find ways to make them available to other people and make them possible for other other countries to adopt. So we work on a lot of this stuff. And we can and we can provide these sort of models. Yes. And we're talking about the Institute. It's a UCLA. Uh, UCLA is a part of it, and, and Berkeley is a part of it. So my my former boss, Jerry Brown, is the co-chair, along with the uh, chief uh, Chinese uh, climate negotiator, uh, who is at uh, Tsinghua University. So it's the two universities, but the whole it's system system wide. But other countries look at what what's happening here. Other states probably look at what's happening here. Yeah. Um, yeah companies look at what's happening here and, and that's that all feels really really hopeful to me 
I think so. When you first got started, you, you know, you said that that there really wasn't such a thing as environmental lawyers, but now I, you're not the only one, right? How does the how does that look as a field? Um, well, it's a it's a much larger field than it used to be. Um, even though you know law by its nature is adversarial, you're always uh, not always, but usually you're on the other side of somebody, whether you're in court or whether you're negotiating a deal, whatever it may be. Um, so, uh, you know, law teaches you a lot about how to how to be a fighter, um, mm -hmm. but it also teaches you ways in which you can make agreements and make agreements that can stick. And I see a lot more interest now on the part of young people who are going into law uh, in finding ways that they can do that kind of thing mm -hmm. at the uh, national and international level. So that's pretty oh, exciting. That's great. So that's. So there's a new field in law, the environmental law, and a new kind of lawyer. Yes. Maybe more and more. Hey, um, one more question here. With the looming budget shortfall for the California state government, how can we help you make sure our environmental programs are not cut? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, thank you. What a nice question. I didn't even plant that one. Uh, <laughs> well. I think, you know, <laughs> letting, letting whoever your uh, representatives are in Sacramento know that you, um, that you care about these issues is always a good first step. Um, I, you know, our governor, Gavin Newsom, is very uh, attuned to the environmental issues. And I think he really gets it that um, California's cachet, our future, is in being known as a leader, uh, particularly in the green technology area. And so I think he's gonna be looking for every possible way to keep us uh, in a leadership position. But we're gonna be having some, some tight times for sure if there's no revenue. Um, they, they are looking at creative ways to partner and to um, to uh, uh, borrow money because you can borrow money right now and it's not it's not as uh, scary as it used to be because you know with interest rates just about zero the state has a lot of uh, capacity to uh, sell bonds because people know that we're going to be coming back our economy will be coming back and so people in the financial community are interested in finding ways to to do business with us um, that but we'll we'll go through some pretty harsh discussions during the budget, as you can imagine, because um, there are many many other needs that are very pressing, and where uh, you know we don't know how we're going to raise the money to cover all the general fund obligations that are just being, at the moment, sort of frozen. The the good news about that is, if they could call it good news, is just that uh, you know most of the jobs, for example, that have been lost are lost because of the orders to shut down. And, you know, these these will be coming back, but, but we'll go through a pretty rough trough before we get there. So as a final question, um, uh, so Earth Day is what, 50 years old? Yes. It, this, 50 this, years this, old. Last yeah. month, 50, 50. Yeah. Um, um, so if you could sort of sum up how how it looks right now over the last 50 years um, as we've had an Earth Day, where where are we right now? I think that uh, probably the most important thing that Earth Day did was to raise consciousness of our dependence on a healthy environment as a, as a civilization, as humans, uh, the need to live in harmony with our planet and to recognize what what we uh, owe to it for our livelihood and well-being that you know nature isn't just something out there somewhere else that it's uh, you know it's it's something that's integral to our to our lives and I think there's a much greater realization of that than there was 50 years ago and that that kind of thinking has been incorporated in, in a lot of ways into uh, into the way that we live um, but life is so incredibly complicated in an advanced society like ours that it's hard for people to figure out on a day-to-day -day basis 
which products to buy, you know, or how to choose where to live. And um, particularly when we don't make it easy for people to understand. And frankly, I do think that there has been a, an opposition that has been built up over that amount of time, which doesn't necessarily reflect the views of most people, but there's this almost, uh, well, for lack of a better word, I'm, I'm gonna call it a sort of a libertarian idea that um, I don't have to do any of this stuff because you know I'm fine and other people ought to just sort of suck it up and not be wimps about demanding all this environmental protection and you know why should we be doing things just because there's people who have asthma or you know why should we be staying home now when uh, yeah. only a few people are going to get sick and die so it's a same it's a similar kind of attitude I personally do not regard that as the majority view I don't think that's the way most people think or feel about their neighborhoods and their communities and I think the more that we are able to explain what uh, what we're doing um, in those kinds of terms, the the more we're able to uh, to get people to take actions that are good for good for society as a whole and and good for the planet as a whole. Well, that's great. So so the so the the main purpose of Earth Day to to raise awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, it worked. We it are did. more aware than we were. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think you hardly ever meet anybody nowadays who won't say, oh, I'm an environmentalist. And sometimes they'll say, but, dot, dot, dot. But that's, <laughs> if they start with, I'm an environmentalist. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Um, I don't think so. This has been a really fun conversation. I'm so happy that many of my friends from St. James, whose names you read out, were um, able to participate in this conversation. Yeah, they were, and we're, we're so grateful to you. So Grateful, so proud, so proud to know you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Have a great weekend. And you good too. Morning, everyone, thanks for being part of the chat. And we'll see you Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> good night, Muti, also. Oh, thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.